Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm excited because I'm about to participate in a voter panel following the vice presidential debate. So we're getting all set up here. We had a cameraman who came and set us up and it's pretty exciting. I'm just about to watch this debate and see if I can weigh in, uh, you know, given some of my perspectives as a woman, as a climate scientist, as a public health expert, an educator, a mom, all of these different uh, kind of hats that I wear and um, looking forward to an exciting debate. Tonight, Senator Kamala Harris and VP Mike Pence took the stage in the 2020 vice presidential debate. The event had less chaos than the presidential debate, but still plenty of contention. Joe Biden has been very clear. He will not raise taxes on anybody who makes less than $400,000 a year. He said he's going to repeal the Trump tax cut. Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. They spoke about responding to the pandemic ravaging our country. When I look at their plan that talks about advancing testing, creating new PPE, developing a vaccine, um, it looks a little bit like plagiarism. And the issue of social justice in America. Bad cops are bad for good cops. We need reform of our policing in America and our criminal justice system. But did Senator Harris or Vice President Pence change any minds? We'll ask four Southern California voters right now. Good evening, my name is Emmett Singh. Thanks for being with us after a plexiglass filled vice presidential debate, just one way in which it was unprecedented. Tonight we heard directly from the candidates, but we also wanna make sure we're hearing directly from voters like you. So after each debate, we're inviting a panel of voters to share their thoughts right here on this show. Each panel will represent a specific demographic, but while demographics are important in politics, so is understanding that no demographic is monolith. There is diversity within the demo. So tonight we're joined by four female Southern California voters from different points on the political spectrum. And next week, millennial voters will join us for the second presidential debate, and a panel of first responders will join us for the final debate on October 22nd. So with that said, let's get to know the voters we have with us tonight. Up first, we'll start with Carrie Mellon, who is a small business owner living in Simi Valley. Her top concerns are equal rights, equal health care for all, and climate change. You might recognize her as one of our undecided voters from during the primary season, but she has decided and she plans to vote for Joe Biden. Renita Duncan also joins us. She lives in West Los Angeles. She's a civil servant who has volunteered and worked at the polls in the past. Her top issues are prison reform, the Supreme Court, and health care. Renita voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, but this year, in 2020, she plans to vote for President Donald Trump. Then we have Mimi Nardi. She lives in Playa Vista and works as a social entrepreneur, previously as a college professor. Mimi's top issues are achieving a capitalist democracy and equitable access to education and health care. Mimi plans to vote for Joe Biden. And finally, we have Rachel Gunther, who is a semi-retired small business owner living in Long Beach. She also teaches Zumba. Her top issues are the economy, immigration, national security, and education. Rachel is voting for Donald Trump. Now that we've met the voters, let's hear from the candidates. And we begin with the nation's most pressing issue, the pandemic. Harrison Pence spoke about the Trump administration's coronavirus response tonight. Take a look. On January 28th, the vice president and the president were informed about the nature of this pandemic. They were informed that it's lethal in consequence, that it is airborne, that it will affect young people, and that it would be contracted because it is airborne. And they knew what was happening and they didn't tell you. Can you imagine if you knew on January 28th, as opposed to March 13th, what they knew, what you might have done to prepare? Before there were more than five cases in the United States, all people who had returned from China. President Donald Trump did what no other American president had ever done. And that was he suspended all travel from China, the second largest economy in the world. With the president who is COVID positive and the leader of the coronavirus task force on the stage, the stakes for this particular conversation were high tonight. And on that point, I want to turn to all the voters and just say it's wonderful to see your faces. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Rachel, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, you have felt that VP Pence has done a good job as a coronavirus task force leader. You told me that in an earlier conversation. Tonight, he spoke to his record of pandemic management. How do you think he did tonight? I think he did extremely well. Um, you have to remember that when this first, when COVID was first discovered, China and WHO were very sparing in their reporting of the severity of the of the virus. So when President Trump 
mid-January, suspended travel from China and even other hotspots in Europe, I think it did a great service to our country because it slowed down the exponential um, cases, the exponential surge of the cases in our country. Uh, he then created aggressive, immediately created a task force with, with Vice President uh, Pence uh, and also Operation Warp Speed, which was the, the purpose of which was to develop a potential vaccine, uh, therapeutics, any kind of antiviral that, you right. know, that they could possibly find. So, yeah, so yeah. I thought he did pretty Thanks for that, Rachel. And I want to turn to Kerry. Now, Kerry, you're voting for uh, Biden and Harris. And you said that you told me you'd given uh, Pence an F grade for his work as the leader of the coronavirus task force. So tonight, did anything change your mind on that front? And did you feel that Kamala Harris presented a more cogent response to the coronavirus pandemic? Uh, you know, he got another F grade tonight because first off, he started with a lie, which was closing down. What did he say? He said he suspended all travel. Well, he didn't suspend all travel. Uh, if you were a citizen, you could still come through. If you were a, um, a, a, a worker, uh, um, uh, let's see, there were citizens, permanent residents, and essential workers could still come through. And it was found that when they tracked, when they traced the virus, people were actually coming in from Europe anyway. So he lied right off the bat. And also, to start this event, to start this debate with him uh, mocking Kamala for wanting a divider between them, well, that kind of tells you how the last four years have gone uh, and how his uh, coronavirus handling, which which has been complete incompetence. You know, right. the West Wing is his house. That's mm. his house. And look what's happened. All of the people in the West Wing which have contracted the disease. That is definitely the news in the context for this conversation tonight. Um, Mimi, when I want to come to you as a scientist. I know that you are very data-oriented, very facts-oriented. There were uh, different conceptions of the facts tonight when it came to the coronavirus. What did you hear tonight about the coronavirus pandemic, the response, and the facts that were discussed related to it? Okay, so because I have a, a background actually in public health, I am really looking for leadership that uh, understands science and has a mastery of these scientific epistemologies and can communicate with scientists and the general public. And this administration has completely failed in its handling of COVID. I think Senator Harris was absolutely 100% right to say that on the basis of COVID alone, they forfeited their administration. I was really disappointed in the way that Vice President Pence skirted around the issues and just said that America Americans have sacrificed a lot. As a matter of fact, we have. I've been distance learning with my children all day. Um, I think it was completely disingenuous uh, for him to insinuate that Senator Harris's skepticism about the readiness of a vaccine is undermining scientists when the reality is Trump, the Trump administration has undermined scientists uh, right. and confidence in public health protocol since January. Renita, uh, you know, we're talking a bit about modeling behavior. We're talking about confidence in a vaccine. A lot of this comes down to fear or confidence. And you were telling me that you felt that the Trump-Pence uh, ticket has been avoiding fear, and that was something aspirational, something good about their response. What did you hear tonight? Did you still feel that was true? And do you really feel that Senator Harris is operating from a place of fear about this pandemic? Yes, I, I really feel like when we talk about leadership, and sharing of information, it's very important to empower people. And the fact that President Trump did not mention anything in January would not have changed how people reacted to finding out the information. And he allowed himself time as a leader, him and Pre uh, Vice President Pence, to plan a strategy in which we could go through this pandemic, which we have never seen before in the history of our United States, not anything as bad but besides the 1800s. This is something new that we're all going through. And for them to be able to, as leaders, right. take responsibility and say, yes, we're going to share the information and not incite fear, for me, was a good idea. So I think he did well. Renita, you are right that this is a debate about leadership, and it's so interesting to see the way that this pandemic is touching so many other issues, including, of course, the economy. Tonight we heard about the economy, and there was a lot discussed about the recovery from this pandemic. It's an issue that's relevant to everyone, but disproportionately impacting women. Tonight we're speaking with men, women voters, so let's listen to one of the most dispirited exchanges on this point this evening. Joe Biden has been very clear 
He will not raise taxes on anybody who makes less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. He said he's going to repeal the Trump tax cuts. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. Well, wait, wait. I'm speaking. It'd be important if you said the truth. Right. Joe Biden has said <laughs> twice in the debate last week that he's going to repeal the Trump tax cuts. That was tax cuts that gave the average working family. $2,000 in a tax break every single year. That is, Senator, that is that's the math. absolutely not true. That is, he only bill, cutting, is he only going to repeal part of the Trump tax cuts? If you don't mind letting me finish, we can Please. then have a conversation, okay? Please. Okay. Joe Biden will not raise taxes on anyone who makes less than $400,000 a year. He has been very clear about that. Joe Biden will not end fracking. He has been very clear about that. <laughs> Joe Biden is the one who, during the, the Great Recession, was responsible for the Recovery Act that brought America back. And now the Trump-Pence administration wants to take credit. Women are leaving the, the workforce at four times the rate of men, and only 34 percent of women's jobs have come back, compared to a much higher percentage for men. So, of course, this is impacting women disproportionately. Mimi, you did your doctoral dissertation on women's empowerment. This is something you really think about. But you also told me that the Democrats need to do a better job of articulating their vision for recovery. Did you hear that tonight from Kamala Harris and in that sound that we just heard? I thought Senator Harris was actually very effective. So, look, on the Trump side, I think he's done a good job renegotiating, renegotiating NAFTA, but that's really not enough for me. I think that, you know, in a democracy as developed as ours, we need options and opportunities for all citizens to pursue uh, education and health care. Otherwise, we're a developing country. Uh, so I think, um, you know, You'll find ultra high net worth individuals in even the poorest countries in the world. The difference between a developed country and a developing country is the standard of living for the poorest citizens and the size of the pipeline of social and economic mobility uh, for you know right. citizens in the lower and middle classes. Rachel, as a retiree, the economy is important to you. Your 401 OK is important to you, as so many people who are joining us tonight. Uh, when you think about the economic plan that uh, Biden is presenting that, that through Harris and tonight that Pence was speaking about through Trump uh, or vice versa, Trump through uh, Pence through Trump, tell me about what you heard tonight and who do you have more confidence in in the economy? Well, before the pandemic hit, we had a booming economy. Everybody was benefiting from this econ the Trump economy. Um, Look at what's happened since since the COVID and the pandemic affected the country and the economy. 22 million jobs were lost. And within months, we now have a V-shaped recovery. We have about 11 million jobs recovered. And so to me, I think that's very important to note that, you know, only he, President Trump's plans work. You know, it worked before and it's going to work again. And I believe and I trust that he will bring us back to another booming economy with four more years. Carrie, as a small business owner, this is something that might affect you too. We're talking a lot about the tax plan, the Trump tax plan possibly being repealed. Uh, VP Biden has his own tax plan. What did you hear tonight? And as a small business owner, who do you have more confidence in economically? Oh, you know, I do not have confidence in Trump and Pence. They have alienated our allies across the globe. They've started this China trade war, which has affected my business severely. The tariffs uh, from China that we get our product uh, from are very steep and have changed our structure dramatically. Uh, now, he's saying that China is paying for these tariffs, but we are, as business right. owners, as small business owners, we are paying these tariffs. It has really taken our business to our knees and we've had to think of a whole new way to uh, support our business at this time and I can I imagine that so many other businesses are having the same problem that we are. Renita, uh, when you and I spoke earlier, you were worried about there being an increase to, on taxes to the middle class. Uh, we were talking tonight about two different conceptions of Biden's tax plan. Uh, you were hearing one way from Pence, one way from Harris. What did you hear tonight and did tonight give you any confidence in the economy one way or another? I do have confidence in the leadership that we currently have based on our economy pre-COVID. Unemployment rate rose for, for minorities during this term. And I believe given another four years and the opportunity to get past this epi epidemic that President Trump and Vice President Pence will get us back to that level. They are coming with actual plans. 
I, I don't like the fact that I have to what if or guess what right. President Biden will do right. if he becomes president. You know, Rena, and right now, there is no clarity right. in what they're planning on doing. Well, I have to say, we're just scratching the surface of the conversation for tonight and also just scratching the surface in terms of the topics that were discussed at this debate. The moderator asked both Harris and Pence whether justice was served in the Breonna Taylor case, leading to both candidates to debate the prospects of implicit bias on, in the policing system. Our voters will weigh in on that in just a few minutes. Welcome back. My name is Amit Singh, and we are speaking with a panel of voters from your communities about what we heard from Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris in the debate tonight. We're going to be doing this every week after each debate. Next week, millennial voters will join us, and for the final debate, we'll be joined by first responders. Tonight, we are joined by a wonderful panel of four female Southern California voters from across the political spectrum. Before the break, we spoke about the coronavirus and its crippling impact on the economy, a persistent issue in this election beyond that, and during this year, has been the debate over race and the prospect of implicit bias in policing and protest and the rhetoric on both sides. Tonight, we heard the candidates address all of that. Take a listen. And with regard to George Floyd, there, there's no excuse for what happened to George Floyd. And justice will be served. But there's also no excuse for the rioting and looting. And I must tell you, this, this, this presumption that you hear consistently uh, from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, that, uh, that America is systemically racist. Mm -hmm. And that, as Joe Biden said, that he believes that law enforcement has an implicit bias against minorities uh, is, is a great insult to the men and women who serve in law enforcement. We are talking about an election in 27 days where last week, the President of the United States took a debate stage in front of 70 million Americans and refused to condemn white supremacists. Not true. And Not true. it wasn't like he didn't have a chance. He didn't do it, and then he doubled down. And then he said, when pressed, stand back, stand by. So this was fascinating. What we saw play out on that stage was two diametrically opposed perceptions of the issue of race in America. And I, I want to turn to Renita. Renita, when you and I spoke, you sort of predicted in your words that it would be Kamala Harris who played the race card tonight. Is that your perception of what you saw in that conversation between Harris and Pence? Yes, exactly as I predicted. We want to continue to play on the emotions of the American people by inciting the division, by saying the leader of our free country, for some reason, is racist when he is the one who has done the most prison reform than a president in the last eight years. He is the one who has, in the last three years, he's already um, denounced supremacy. He's already done it, and he's done it on the news. You can go on YouTube and see it. So for, for us to, con to keep perpetuating this systematic racism and uh, getting people to feel sorry for the American people, Black Americas or color people of America, right. it, it uh, distracts us. From, from the real issues that we need to be concerned about when we go vote. Well, Renita, I'm going to go directly to Kerry on this, because when we spoke, Kerry, you said that it was the mm -hmm. Trump-Pence ticket that is inciting racial uh, animus by virtue of not acknowledging implicit oh, bias. So time. is that what you heard tonight? This, absolutely. This is the most corrupt and criminal administration we have ever had before. The way they incite violence is like nothing I have ever seen. Just in my own little community here, I can see the people on my Facebook family, uh, friendly pages, you know, they think that Q is going to come and shoot up our town, and they, and they think that Antifa is coming, and they're, they're on their phones, and they're on their Facebook trying to get their guns together and put them by the door and meet down at the gates. And, and I've, I've never seen so so much hate and division by one administration. And um, th th for Trump and Pence to not recognize the racial injustice in 2020 with all of this going on and George Floyd, right. um, it's, it's sickening. It's absolutely sickening. 
Rachel, as an immigrant, as a woman of color yourself, a Filipino American, uh, have, do you feel that there is an issue with systemic racism in this country, either towards Asian Americans or Black Americans, from your understanding of it? From my, from my perspective, I see nothing but opportunity from this country. Um, we have not had year. I my culture has not had any years of affirmative action any kind of special treatment and opportunities provided to me, and yet we somehow manage. You know, we somehow manage to overcome poverty and we somehow manage to succeed in life and not be uh, encountering law enforcement in a hostile manner. So we're very law-abiding citizens, and I think if you're law-abiding, the chances of you encountering hostility from law enforcement is pretty slim or, 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 or minimal. So I, I really feel that I, I believe in law enforcement, I believe in, in, in law and order, and I'm sure that many women in this country feel the same way. Mimi, you do think that there is an issue with policing in America, but, and you also told me that you thought that tonight Kamala Harris uh, needs to be, you're a communicator, and you wanted to hear Kamala Harris communicate directly to this issue, what the problem was and what a solution was. So I want to bring it to you on that point. Did you feel satisfied on that front from Kamala Harris? Absolutely. I think that she hit head on with the issue. So here's the thing. I don't think that many people really understand the theoretical underpinnings of a capitalist democracy. There is no way to reconcile Adam Smith's invisible hand with systemic bias, with racism, with xenophobia, with homophobia, with sexism, with any kind of prejudice. So anyone who's really truly serious about capitalism and free market systems really needs to be very serious about systemic bias. And tonight, Mike Pence got on the stage and said, out of his own mouth that he's completely ignorant to the experiences of black people, brown people, differently abled people, all different kinds of marginalized people in this uh, in this uh, society, and that he doesn't really even care to find out more information about those experiences. It was completely unacceptable, but I was really confident in the plans that Kamala Harris did lay out in terms of uh, uh, reforms to the criminal justice system to address some of these issues. Mike Pence lived under reconstructive. In his lifetime, there was legal segregation. So what is he even talking about? It makes no sense. You know, tonight was a high-stakes debate for so many reasons, one of which, as we mentioned at the top of the show, the president has this COVID-19 disease, making both of these candidates even closer to the presidency themselves, depending on how this election goes. So with their final moments, a quick lightning round, I just want to go around and get a sense if you felt that these candidates were presidential tonight. But I already know how you guys feel in terms of how you're voting for the candidates you're voting for. So, Carrie, I'm going to begin with you and talk about VP Pence. In a word, did you think that he came across as presidential tonight, and why or why not? Not at all. You know, he is a talk show host, and he was a talk show host, and that's why Trump hired him. And the last thing we need uh, is a, four more years of two talk show hosts. I think what is going to be presidential this next four years right. is someone who is honest, who doesn't lie to us daily, and has some morals and good values. And that's um, Kamala and Thank Biden. you, Carrie. Renita, I'm going to come to you. Kamala Harris, did you feel that she passed the bar for being presidential? I'm, I'm going to say no. And let me tell you why. She mentioned relationships. And we don't need people that want good relationships and sell off our company. We right. need leadership that's going to empower our community. Thank you, Renita. Not relationships, leadership. Thank you for that, Renita. Rachel, I want to come to you for Kamala Harris. Did you feel that she was presidential tonight? Well, when, you're, when your manner is condescending and snarky and a little bit whiny, you know, there, there's no need for that. You're in a professional forum. You know, you're pre you're there to present a case. <laughs> Rachel, I'm going to take I'm going to take that as a no from you. If that, if I can be so bold, because <laughs> I thought that the story was going. Mimi, come to you with the final quick word, just in a word. Did you think that VP Pence was presidential? Uh, Vice President Pence, you know, by the standard of the president that we have in this office, he was consistent with the gaslighting and and you know. The, um, skewing the facts. Okay, and Mimi, I'm going to have to cut it off there. Thank yeah. you so much. But I'm going to take that as a no also. And I want to thank you all so much for bringing your voices tonight for a wonderful and civil conversation on the issues. And thank you so much for joining us on this night. Next Thursday, October 15th, we'll be doing this again for the second presidential debate with another panel of South California voters. Before that, join us tomorrow at 930 for more analysis. Thank you.